Have you ever felt the heartbreak of watching your beloved plant wither away and die before your very eyes? I know I have, and let me tell you, it's not a pretty sight. That's why I'm here to share with you the 10 cruelest houseplant care lessons that I've learned the hard way so that you can avoid these common pitfalls and keep your plants thriving and flourishing. Trust me, if I'd known these lessons earlier, I would have had a lot more plants in my house than I currently do. On the 5th of November 2022, I released a video called I Got the Most Stunning Plant I've Ever Seen. It was a plant unboxing video in which I was sent some beautiful plants through the mail, including the Philodendron Vericosum, a Philodendron Melanocrosum, and a few Alocasias, and I was all excited to receive such stunning rare plants. Little did I know at the time that I was going to experience so many problems with these plants that I'm only now starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. You see, the problem was that I was sent these plants during cold weather in the autumn. Since that fateful day, they've had a really hard time recovering from the shock of being exposed to the good old British autumnal chill. The Vericosum was a disaster more or less straight away. All the leaves deteriorated immediately by turning crispy brown, which I had to cut off one by one. Each cut was like a dagger to my heart. The Melanocrysum tried to push out a new leaf a couple of weeks after delivery but it went crispy brown and died before it unfurled. I shrugged this off and hoped for better with the next leaf unfurling but to my horror the same thing happened again. Now you might think that these issues are due to humidity problems in my home but I'm not so sure and for two reasons. First, the spot these plants live in gets a humidity range between 60 and 70 percent which should be fine for these plants. And second, since the turn of spring this year things are starting to turn around. The Vericosum has been pushing out new growth that is looking much healthier and the Melanocrysum has at last unfurled a new leaf and it started to push out another one. It seems these plants are over the shock of traveling through the cold weather and are settled into their new homes. The moral of the story here is to be extremely careful about when you buy your plants and how they're being transported by the seller if you're buying them online. Whilst my plants were transported beautifully, the seller didn't include any heat pads which would have provided some valuable warmth during transportation. And if you're buying from your local garden center during cold weather, just make sure they wrap the plant up in paper to protect it from the elements. It really can make a big difference. The one thing that makes me entertain the idea of getting rid of all of my plants in my home is the fact that those incredibly annoying fungus gnats that are constantly buzzing around my plants will go with them. I hate these things, I really do. I've been battling these little buggers for years and just when I think I've won the war, they come roaring back with a vengeance by invading my green friends again. This sense of victory tends to happen in winter when the numbers seem to decrease due to the cold but soon evaporates in the spring when they start flying across my face when I'm watching TV. The lesson I've learned the hard way is that you need to start your defenses early before the problem starts or at least gets out of control. The problem is though that they're just so hard to combat. Why? Because of the three stage life cycle they have. You need a solution that deals with all three stages otherwise they just come back just when you think you've won. The adult lays the egg in moist soil that then turns into larvae that then turns into an adult that then lays an egg that turns into larvae that then turns into an adult that then lays an egg that then turns into a larva two hours later. You get the idea. All three stages need to be destroyed. It's no use just going after the adults because there will already be eggs and larvae in the soil that are just waiting to turn into adults. And you can't just go after the eggs and larvae because the adults are broody little buggers and constantly lay eggs in the soil. Mosquito dunks are the gold standard for treating gnats but these target the larvae only. You need to back these up with something that killed the adults so they stop laying eggs and repeating the process. I use those yellow sticky cards and they are pretty good but they won't be catching every single gnat in your plant, it's impossible. Chances are they'll just fly off onto another plant and start a new home there. It's taken me too long to come to this realization but plants just do not do well in terracotta pots. I started buying terracotta pots from my local nursery at the beginning of last year. I was watching lots of YouTube channels where they had some of their plants in terracotta pots and it was a look I really liked. I do think they look charmingly rustic in these pots. So off I trotted to my local garden centre to buy a bunch to pot some of my plants into. I was also pleasantly surprised at how cheap they were. I've since realised now though that plants just dry out far too quickly in these pots. They're incredibly porous and water just evaporates from them so much quicker than a plastic nursery pot. 
I keep my Peperomia scandens in one and it's really not happy. I'm having to water it twice a week, which is unheard of for a Peperomia. They tend to like drier soil. I also have a smaller peace lily in one of these and the same thing happens. It regularly droops from a lack of water in the soil. These pots just leach the water from the plants so quickly it's ridiculous. The solution is obvious, but it took me ages to figure it out because I'm clearly not the sharpest knife in the kitchen. Glaze your terracotta pots with a varnish suitable for garden pots before putting your plants in. This stops them from being so porous. I've started doing doing this to mine and I've recently repotted my peperomia into a glazed pot and it's looking much healthier. Up next is my peace lily. Perhaps the cruelest lesson I've learned, I wish I'd learned so much sooner because it would have prevented so many of my plants from turning crispy brown, is that water quality is everything. Seriously, the quality of water can make or break sensitive plants like calatheas, zebra plants, diphenbachias and spider plants. These plants with thin delicate leaves are sensitive to the impurities that are often found in the water coming out of the taps. I'm talking chlorine and chloramine mainly, but there are other substances like fluoride and traces of heavy metals that sensitive plants don't like, so it's good to have a plan to avoid this. I've talked about lots of alternatives on the channel before, from rainwater to distilled water to to purified water, but a solution I've turned to and seen great results from is water conditioner. I really wish I'd started using this stuff so much sooner. Water conditioners are big in the aquarium world to make water safe for fish, but they're just as good for our plants. They remove chlorine, chloramines and heavy metals from tap water that gives your calathea a fighting chance of staying blemish free. I've been using this stuff for about three months now and I am seeing some great results. My sensitive plants are looking much healthier. Recently, I've been rehabbing my plant nemesis, the Calafea zebrina, and so far all the leaves are looking pretty good. If you're into gardening, then you'll no doubt know all about the value of good compost to getting good results in the garden. Surely we can use this stuff for our indoor plants, right? Not so fast there, our kids. There's a couple of things you need to know first. First, and I learned this the hard way, don't use the compost that you store in your garden for your indoor plants. You just don't know the kinds of bugs and whatnot that are living in the compost that is exposed to the elements and wildlife in your garden that will potentially do harm to our precious indoor babies. You don't want to risk bugs or harmful bacteria getting into the roots and foliage. I keep a bag of compost in my cellar head and never use the compost that lives in the bin in the garden for indoors. And secondly, never pot up a plant in just compost. It's just too dense a material that over time will suffocate the roots and hinder growth. I used to do this and my plants were just not thriving. Don't get me wrong, compost is fantastic for indoor plants. You just need to amend it with something like perlite to make it suitable. Perlite is highly porous so it provides air and good drainage to compost to allow roots to breathe and not become waterlogged. I recommend buying large 100 litre bags like the one I have in my Amazon store. It's much more economical than buying smaller bags from your local nursery. Another cruel lesson I've learned the hard way is that once you overwater a plant, it can take a long time for it to recover. Sometimes the damage is so great that when all is said and done, you're left with an ugly duckling you want to hide away from your friends and family when they come around to visit. You don't want ugly ducklings ruining the style of your home after all. Take my Chinese money plant for example. A month ago, I was treating my plants with tannin drops as part of my fungus gnat battle and it involved soaking the soil fully to attack the larvae. The problem was though, that a few of my plants already had moist soil. One of them was the Chinese money plant. It did not like getting its soil saturated again. The roots drew up too much water to the leaves, they blistered and then burst, leaving the holes that you can see now. As you know with this plant, once you lose a leaf at the bottom, you're not going to get another one to replace it. So it suffered from overwatering, and it's got the scars to prove it. It's like it's trying to tell its friends how incompetent I am at looking after houseplants. The lesson here is to let the soil dry dry out before watering, even if you're desperately trying to win the war against gnats. You never know how your plants are going to react. I definitely wasn't expecting this from my Chinese money plant and only became aware of the blistering leaf problem after googling it, and by then it was too late. One of the absolute best cheat codes for the ultimate collection of happy thriving plants is root pruning. They respond fantastically well from having a third of their roots chopped off with faster, lusher foliage growth. And in this video here, I show you the evidence to prove it, so don't miss out and click on the link.